Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this conversation on celebration of International Women's Day 2021. I'm so grateful to you all for being here and joining us for this. We're taking for our theme, the UN's theme for the day of women in leadership, achieving equality in a COVID-19 world. And we want to use this time to, together today to talk about how tech has empowered women and how it's failed to empower women over the past year. It's been about a year now since COVID turned all of our lives upside down and it brought with it some really incredible hardships. And for some of us, a few unexpected upsides as well. And I'm convinced that, that has looked different in some specific ways for women than it has for men. Um, Text um, kind of served us in a lot of ways and in some ways um, we might have done better than we thought we could have done in a world where we couldn't interact on that, um, in person. We've still been able to work for many of us, interact socially to some extent, receive education, consume, etc. Um, the pandemic has pushed some of us as individuals and institutions into adopting tech when we might have been uh, reluctant to do so otherwise. But it's also brought home some really hard home truths about how far we've still got to go in terms of women's equality. Women have disproportionately lost jobs during the pandemic. There's a really shocking statistic that 100% of the jobs lost in the US in December were lost to women. They have been um, disproportionately responsible for taking on childcare responsibilities and for taking charge of homeschooling. And even more worryingly, there's been an uptick in cases of domestic violence and where those in-person support services are no longer available, that's even more concerning. So I have certainly, I think speak for a lot of women have been really itching to have a conversation about what we have kind of experienced over the past year and what parts of the changes to our lives we want to take forwards in our post COVID world. And I'm really thrilled that we're able to do that today, even more so to do that with two incredibly impressive women who've accomplished so much in service of women's empowerment. Um, those women are Siobhan McDonough MP, Labour MP for Mitcham and Morden, renowned as being one of the hardest working MPs uh, in Parliament. She takes on thousands of cases every year on behalf of her constituents, and she sp has spoken in Parliament and taken forward campaigns on education, antisocial behaviour, transport, and inclusion. And most recently, she has been pressing Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, to address the digital divide, which has been meaning that so many children aren't able to get the education that they need in the situation that we've been in in the past year, where um, schools have been closed and education has been happening online. And my colleagues at TBI have put out a report on um, achieving universal um, access in the past week. So that's something we could certainly get into in a, uh, in a bit. Um, our second guest is Mia Shah Dand. Uh, at Lighthouse 3, Mia helps organizations make responsible use of innovative technologies like AI. And she also set up the Women in AI Ethics Initiative, which helps to recognize, include, and empower women in this field, um, including setting up the 100 Brilliant Women in AI Ethics list in 2018, which is now published every year and provides a brilliant resource for conference organizers and policy makers to source diverse talent in tech. So thank you both very much for being with us today. I'm really excited that we can have this conversation. The way we're gonna structure this is um, I will come to each panelist in turn and give them a chance to give us their perspective on what the past year has been like for women and how tech has um, helped women to cope. And we'll have a bit of a free flowing discussion back and forth. And then we'll open up the conversation to everyone at home listening. You'll be able to put your questions to the panelists throughout. You can start as of now, typing in the Q&A box. And then when it's time to take questions, I'll unmute you so you can let, ask your question live. Um, if you prefer not to speak, then just mark your question, please read, and I can read it out anonymously, that's fine. Um, we will be able to tweet this as we go along. Uh, use the hashtags TBI Talk and IWG 2021, and we can follow the conversation on Twitter. And the session is going to be recorded, so you'll be able to share it afterwards for anyone that wasn't able to make it in real life. So, without any further housekeeping, let me come to you first, Shivavon. Um, what's the past year been like for your female constituents? What have you heard of their experiences? you know and has tech helped them to cope with 
the the awful events of the last year or you know has it in some ways hindered them what's your perspective i think as always every occasion uh helps some people and doesn't help others and i you know if i uh, reflect on the people who live in my constituency um vast numbers of women have had a really tough time many of them can't work from home because they have caring jobs jobs um, in kind of insecure kind of areas so they have to go out they have children at home do they have people who can look after their children many live in shared housing so it has been a real struggle for many um, and uh, I um, personally, uh, I've been motivated and saved during the lockdown uh, through my work on um, getting uh, tablets and internet connection to children and families that don't currently have it. And it all started back on the first week of the lockdown last year when our brilliant local health visitor, Debbie, for homeless families, rang me and said, Siobhan, what are we going to do? I'm always frightened when she says we. Uh, what are we going to do about all those kids who are in a hostel for homeless families that have got no internet connection and no outside space? So for them, uh, Joe Wicks and his gym classes, as exciting as they were, they were excluded from it. Their ability to learn from home um, was nil. Um, and a way for mum to try and occupy them while she tried to work if she could uh, was really very difficult. So I just wrote to all the mobile phone companies and tech companies and said, hi, I'm an MP, give me some of your stuff because I've got families who need it. And surprisingly, they did. Um, so we spent our time taking uh, equipment out and just learning that what the divide actually was, you know, the, of access with schools that had from uh, the Ursuline Convent, Convent in Wimbledon that gave every girl a tablet from year seven and did six lessons a day um, to schools where 60% of the pupils had no access to the internet or to the equipment other than by a, a mobile and had no opportunity to do online learning. So the divide was huge but it's out in the open and when it's out in the open you can try and do something about it yeah that's absolutely right i think and i wonder what do you think the sort of future opportunity is if we're able to open up access and kind of get over this problem of um, access to the hardware but also high-speed internet connections for all families how could that benefit um poorer communities not only in the kind of prime education sphere but throughout the throughout society um well, it gives chance, uh, the skills to give chance for work and good paid work, uh, because the divide between men and women and um, as Mia will know so much better than me in terms of um, technical skills is huge um, in the terms of what you can earn um, and in the, co in the chance of what you can learn uh, and be entertained by is just enormous. I mean, I, and I, you know, I would just would say that uh, what we didn't appreciate right at the start is perfectly obvious and that is poorer families pay their bills differently so your gas and electricity uh, they don't pay it on a quarterly basis or a direct debit they're going to pay it on a key meter which is the most expensive way of doing it and with a mobile phone it's pay as you go rather than a contract payment so many of these families are excluded uh, from the cheapest way to have internet connection um, and it is that access to the internet uh, that is the really big issue, bigger than actually having the devices uh, and probably a more difficult where, problem to resolve. Yeah, yeah, it's a kind of um, a really difficult structural challenge in society, isn't it? Um, something that we're really interested in is what is the potential of um, the internet to help people um, explore new careers and even businesses and sort of self-employment avenues that they might otherwise not have access to, um, in theory, if if it lives up to its kind of promise you can um it makes it radically easier for people to launch their own business or um launch themselves as a self-employed tradesperson or um artisan and you know if if you um, can harness that then the kind of benefits for labor market participation are you know, potentially really huge um i was really in interested that you mentioned about um do they have childcare and do do people are people able to work at all um, if they're lucky enough to have jobs where they're able to work remotely, um, 
it strikes me that uh, for a lot of women, they were making their lives work, balancing um, tech and uh, balancing, I'm sorry, work and their family through the means of quite an intricate network of, um, you know, after school care and friends and family helping out and, um, you know, sort of very different kinds of childcare provision. And then when the pandemic hit, that sort of all got slightly imploded, meaning that it was all on the family, the immediate family that lived in the same house to organize everything. I don't know if um, you'd have seen, but there was an amazing New York Times article where it compared the lives of American working women. And the cover picture was of two people, a man on a conference call in an office, and next door, the woman was also on a conference call, but was simultaneously wiping a tiny child's bottom. Um, and it really summed it up for me in a really kind of immediate way, the kind of challenge of um, trying to do everything. Um, I was wondering whether there's any extent to which um, you've heard of examples where people have been able to use online platforms or kind of, um, yeah, a sort of internet fora to build new communities and access new kind of support mechanisms that they um, might, might not have known about beforehand. Um, is that to me, uh, Kirsty, oh, or to yes, Mia? That, that was to you, Siobhan. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of not aware of any personally. Um, I was saying to you earlier, I was a bit worried that I was going to be the negative member of this panel because I was going to tell you about all the problems and the difficulties that people have. Um, so I'm not currently um, where I, mean, I know some of this from some of the stuff that, um, you know, the uh, your foundation has been doing in places like Rwanda, where, you know, medicalize it, a sort of a digitalizing medical records, letting people know about health benefits. Uh, and all that stuff. So I can see where the improvement actually lies, but I think um, the dearth over the last 18 months has been the kind of personal support, the personal contact to personal help. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in some ways there's no substituting for that. Mm. Um, there's some, I mean, for me personally, one of my kind of, in a very small way, one thing that I've found really beneficial or a sort of boon in the past year has been next door which is a, a niche one to mention but it made me feel as though I had some insight into what was going on around me when I couldn't go out and sort of talk to neighbours and um, gave me a bit of you know a bit give me a bit of an outlet to ask questions that I might normally be discussing with people that I met on the street you know what's that road yeah. work or what, yeah. I don't know what, what was the sort of noise the other night that kind of thing but yeah it's very uh, and from my own personal experience, um, for the first I was doing, I've been doing little videos about how to get cheap um, internet connection, how to access Oak Academy or BBC Bite Size or whatever. And for the first time, I have people stopping me at the shop saying, thank you, Siobhan, for letting me know about that because I wouldn't have known any other way. Um, we had a particularly horrible incident where a young girl was sexually assaulted and there was a lot of anger in the community and a lot of social media being used for uh, potential violence. And we were able to have a couple of community meetings where we had three, 400 people attend um, because they could, I suppose, because they, you know, they could do it from their home and it was easy. Um, mm. We recently had, um, one of the um, South African variants of coronavirus was found in the constituency. Um, and so we kind of blended kind of tradi more traditional campaigning things of just delivering a letter to everybody in the house and everybody in the area, um, emailing everybody, texting everybody. But again, we had a, a, a Zoom meeting and, you know, 150 people um, came in on a Friday night now. I've been around a long time and I've never got 150 people in a church hall on a Friday night before. <laughs> yep. Yeah, there's some advantages to everyone um, being um, yeah. in on a Friday night, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and frustrating as it might be to have to do meetings by Zoom, there are some advantages and some, you know, um, at least at least we are able to keep going in that kind of community engagement and that kind of democratic participation through those channels. Um, great. Let me turn to you, Mia. Um, your uh, work with Women in AI Ethics aims to promote awareness and promote recognition and, um, and sort of uh, reward and inclusion of women in tech and in AI ethics specifically. And I wondered what are your sort of, what's your take on um, how tech, tech's always been kind of crucial to, our, to, to people's work lives for you know, decades, but the past year has made it absolutely um, kind of central. 
And I wondered, you know, in, in myriad ways from the kind of micro, is it easier or harder to make your voice heard and put your ideas forward if you're on a video call as opposed to in person to the macro where um, we've seen um, because of the way jobs are distributed in the economy, women have been um, disproportionately affected by unemployment. What are the ways in which um, kind of tech has and the pandemic has made it easier or harder for women to have their voices heard? Sure. Thank you, first of all, Kirsty, for having me. It's wonderful to be spending this day with such inspiring women. And sure, I'm just so inspired by your work. I really enjoyed hearing about how you're working so hard to help your constituents, especially women, need the support that they need. So I appreciate being here. So um, I do have my own negative stories and negative spin. Sure, you're not the only one. So let me start with a positive first. Uh, I was, um, I dropped out of, uh, I'm based in California, I'm here in Oakland, uh, cloudy Oakland today, and I have worked in the Silicon Valley for a long time. I worked at many leading tech companies, but I had to drop out about six years back. I had a young child, uh, my child is transgender, and we have just going through a lot of personal challenges. And for me, as a single mother, it was just impossible to keep up with the pace and technology. Uh, the corporate world is just not built for women. And I was at a point where either I had to be in office every day doing face-to-face -face meetings or I could be at home with my child. So those were my two options. And the interesting thing is these technologies, it's not that they're new. We talk about Zoom today, we talk about Google Meet and Hang Hangouts. They've been around for uh, since 2011. So these are not new technologies. We have had access to them. But the, 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 so today when I see more usage of them, I'm thrilled because women are getting access to these technologies. Employers are so much more open to it uh, for women to work from home, but it's also they're being forced into it. But it's actually working in favor of women. So all in support of that. Women are able to then multitask. We, we are aces, right? At multitasking, we do that all the time. <laughs> like you said with the child, like we are on our computers and we are still doing work. We are taking care of kids in the background. Uh, but that's the negative though. Um, so one more positive from that, you mentioned the, the boys club. There are meetings happening out there before the pandemic, which were out in the golf courses, in bars, after hours. Women did not have access to those spaces. And all of a sudden with the pandemic, one of the upsides is those don't exist because they can't go out and meet without women. Women have to also be present. So it makes it easier in some ways to actually be part of those meetings, uh, make your voices heard. But the challenge is it's been a triple whammy for women. And as Shiwan just eloquently pointed out is, one is access to opportunities has been so, the, the jobs which are being, uh, affected the most are the ones that women have, which are not as technical, because we are seeing a big issue there. And even with technical jobs, you, there is a gap between those who have high speed internet and those who don't. I know women who sit outside libraries trying to tap into their internet systems because they don't have it at home, right? So we completely forgot, uh, forgot about our technology is good, but is it good for everyone? Does everyone have access to it? We are working right now as part of Women in AR Ethics. There's a community in Mexico, indigenous community, and they don't have access to internet. And everything that Shawan laid out was the way they consume internet, the way they have access to it, the way they pay for it. So we've been trying to support them and fund them to even get access to the internet. It's, it's a very small price. They said maybe for $100, we can get access to it per month. And it, but it's so small for someone in the Western world and yet in other communities, they can't even have access to that, to the basics. So there's that. Yeah. So it, it, what's happened now in this pandemic world is bust the myth that women can have it all. It's literally women are doing it all. And once the support systems, like it's a myth, right? I, I've just been screaming at it from top of my um, lungs here because we have been sold into this myth. You can do it all. You can go to the work, you go into the workforce, you can work. Uh, but the support systems that are propping this all up, once we lose access to it, whether it's daycare, childcare uh, services, a support system, our parents who used to be able to help us, once that's gone, 
it, it, the the burden of all of those uh, the support system that everything else that we were outsourcing is again back on the women so it's just been brutal for women and the more we can do to support them it's it's absolutely essential because they're going to fall behind as they are already mm -hmm. yep i would recognize that um you sort of mentioned that um when you started speaking to them that the the shift to remote working has been in some ways a benefit for women and i think that um, if it means that flexible working becomes the norm or becomes mainstreamed or becomes acceptable, then that's a great thing. And I've kind of really enjoyed some of the remote working benefits of getting a bit of a glimpse into my colleagues' life outside work. You know, the, the fact that many meetings do get interrupted by a pet or a child or a housemate or a, a spouse. I think it's really salutary to be reminded that your colleagues are people who have a you know, a whole life and what you know of them at work is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and I think it's it's great if um, we take away from this kind of year um, an appreciation that people have lives outside work and an appreciation that people might need to organise their work differently and that might need to work flexibly. And if we make sure that our organisations are set up so that you can work effectively from outside the office and you're, you know, you're in all the right conversations. But that's a bit of a, a big if. And as you said, for some women as well, being able to mingle life and work has just meant having to do both all the time. Um, and Siobhan, that's, there's been a, a, an increasing debate in the past few years about what that means for female politicians in our country and how our system is designed to, um, to work and how that could be more inclusive um, and how that could be more sort of supportive of everyone's family life, not just women, of course. And I wondered, what do you think it will take um, both for, um, for women in, you know, at, at large, and for um, for politicians to get that more equal balance of responsibilities, is it is it a policy change or is it a cultural change? What what would it what would be most helpful to allow us to kind of um, not have to do everything at once? I think I think it I think it's kind of tick all the above. Do you know what I mean? But I think the issue of I think the issue of childcare is just enormous, you know, for many women uh, who can't work from home, who worked outside the home, they relied on informal kind of childcare, mum, dad, uh, grandmother, and all of a sudden that wasn't there anymore. Uh, and there wasn't, uh, and there wasn't, uh, you know, the ability to do it. So there was many women who spoke to me, particularly in retail, kind of were, were praying that they were going to be furloughed, you know, because that was the only way, because they worked antisocial hours. So when the school was off in the evenings and the weekends and your wraparound childcare disappears, you know, what do you do? Um, and we're, we're back to the kind of problems of finding good, affordable childcare, because certainly uh, Mia, from a London perspective, you can be a woman on a really good income but once you need to pay your mortgage and pay your childcare, there isn't a great deal left, even for women who objectively we might see as being earning quite well. So, and um, many women ran those childcare businesses that then had to close, that weren't getting the support that other businesses got. And so I think something like two thirds of childcare businesses in London are at risk of collapse. And it's the women who run those businesses. So I think we are in a parlous state. Yeah, it feels like a market that's malfunctioning in so many ways in that it's so hard to find good childcare and so expensive as a consumer. And yeah. yet as a supplier, you're also under huge amounts of pressure, I guess, yeah. partly due to the amount of regulatory requirements, yeah. the, um, you know, the kind of, um, those kind of burdens, but it's, it's not working for anyone at the moment. Do you think it's a case of, um, structuring the market differently? Do you think it's a case of more government spending to support families with getting hold of good childcare? Or what do you think, would, what's gonna make the difference? Um, I think it, I think the people who need childcare are people principally, not exclusively in their thirties and their forties. And they are very important in terms of voting because they're the people who vote. Uh, so I think politicians of all parties will pay more attention to them. Um, and I, I just got some really interesting statistics here that I, I wondered if people might be interested. And that is the figure, uh, the figures from the Office of National Statistics shows that women carried out two thirds of the childcare in the first lockdown. 
Mums were also one and a half times more likely than dads to have either lost their job or quit since the first lockdown. The TUC, the, our trade union uh, congress, found one in six working mums had to reduce their hours due to childcare commitments. And a third of working mothers reported having lost work or hours due to a lack of childcare during the pandemic. And this rose to 44% when it came to black, Asian and ethnic minority mothers. So, you know, there is a feeling of back to the 50s, isn't there, about this? Yes, uh, it's, it's really kind of shocked me how quickly it turned out that it was going to be more likely to be women who were having to cut back on hours or even resign from jobs altogether to take on childcare responsibilities. I think I'd assumed that kind of society had evolved a bit more than that and there would have been you know it would have been more of an even even split but I guess um not necessarily it's really hard to shake that um can I add yeah. something to what Siobhan said it's it, it's interesting that you mentioned it because I've always felt that the framing is inaccurate we position these issues as women's issues but I think Siobhan what you hit upon it, it affects families mm -hmm. so yes the burden is on women but without women, we, the rest of the economy cannot operate. And that's why it needs to be issued more as a societal issue. Um, and I'll give you an example, a personal example. I was working back in my corporate days, I was working with a woman and we both started at the same time and she was pregnant and she just couldn't cope. And it was just harder and harder. And I said, did you talk to your manager about it? And she said, yes, I did, but he's not being very cooperative and it's not being helpful. That's just how the culture is. And a few months later, and we were brainstorming ideas. And a few months later, I talked to her manager, who's my peer. And he's telling me he's planning to quit because he wants to spend more time with his two mm -hmm. girls. So end of the day, it, we have to start looking at these issues as to bring more women into that decision making, because it feels like men are making decisions for women. And then we frame it as a women's issue, it doesn't get enough attention. So I do feel it's like this double whammy. I was just curious if Siobhan thought differently. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's a whole pushback from, from certain men, isn't there, to, care, to want to spend more time caring for their children. Um, and as women work and, you know, are equal players in bringing, you know, financially supporting the family and that family can be, you know, parents and children, but also very often in some communities, it's grandparents, it's, you know, younger siblings, it's, it's so much more complicated and the ecosystem around families is, you know, just so complicated um, that I, I mean, um, I, I, I think, I think that you're, I think that you're right. Um, and, and there's a lot of, um, you know, we can give statistics on women who uh, are taking fewer hours or losing their jobs. The statistics we don't know are the women who think, you know, I'd really love to take the next step in my career, but I just don't think I can juggle it all. I just can't do that. And how many companies and organizations are losing out because really talented women just don't feel able to do that because it's too risky for the balance of their families? There have been statistics I've been looking at those. Those look horrifying. There are more women who are dropping out of the workforce. And I thought it was me, and I'm talking six years back. And mm. we fast forward to today, and it hasn't changed. We're still seeing women who are stepping back. It's a lot to take on. And then there's also this issue of women who want to. So one of the ways that you can get ahead is being visible. You publish more, say, in a science career. And we're finding that even in science journals, women are submitting fewer papers, which also sets them back in the careers. But at the same time, men are not having to face the same challenges are actually submitting more. So right there, you see that inequality then inequity just manifests itself in career opportunities. They're dropping out, they can't move forward and then they're taking a step back. It's across the board. And it's, if we don't fix it right now, we don't address it, it is going to affect us for generations. Mm -hmm. really and what does it look like in tech specifically, Mia? I think sometimes um, some of us have the uh, tendency to assume that tech as a kind of new and innovative um, sector is a bit more progressive um, and you know may take a, take more account of people's need for a life outside work and maybe maybe a bit more um, supportive but is that right or is that a misperception? 
uh, a gross misperception. I know it sounds very glossy as someone who's been on both sides, inside tech companies and also outside, I would say that it is a world built by men for men. And it's very hard for women to even, if you think about Silicon Valley and who runs the companies, it's all across the board, it's all men. We barely see any women represented. Uh, we'd recently published research on nonprofits um, in the AI space and who have billions of dollars in funding from the government, from private donors. And we're seeing the same trend. We're seeing even folks working on responsible AI, ethics of AI. Again, it's also being led by men. It's controlled by men. There are barely any women. And there were barely three, three black. We looked at 30 organizations accounting for about $2 billion in funding. And there were barely three black people on the leadership teams out of 100. Okay. almost 100. So it's, a, it's, it's been pervasive. You're seeing what's happening with Dr. Tim and Gabru and other women who've been forced out of positions at top leading companies like Google. And, and uh, Facebook came under criticism for discrimination also uh, recently. So it feels like I, to what Siobhan said, we can only have a conversation as everything is out in the open. We can start addressing those issues now. And we are seeing that um, well, and which is why the technology is also not built for women, right? Because uh, at Women in AI Ethics, our philosophy, our principle is simple. Our, we believe that any technology that excludes half of humanity, more than half, right? If you think of women, people of color, any technology that excludes more than half of humanity is not ethical. So you can't have a conversation, here's technology is ethical, but we want to include voices of women. It doesn't work that way. You have to include. So we focus on getting more women on boards, getting women represented at events. Um, in every conversation where there are decisions being made, we need a woman at the table. And not just any woman, it's women with lived experiences. We try to get more working parents to our events. And you know what? Those are the hardest ones. Those are the hardest voices to hear because they're so busy. They're the busy taking care of the families, of the parents, of the children. So we have to make special accommodations and we do that. We give them more leeway on deadlines. We say, it's okay, you can, I'll help you write that, uh, your event description. I'll help you with that. And then when those women show up and it's just so powerful because these are voices you've never heard from before. So we have to rethink the way that we accommodate women and because this world built by men for men, is, it's just not working for women. Quite right. So let's um, at that point um, turn to our attendees and take a question or two from um, the audience. And can I ask Azu Ulusoy, can you ask your question? In fact, you have two questions um, if you'd like to ask both and we can put those to the panelists. Um, I will unmute you in a second and you'll need to turn your mic on in order to do that. Hmm. I can't see you to unmute you. Okay, I will ask the questions on your behalf then. So the questions that Azu put forward were, one, what's the one thing that you would choose to challenge in your capacity over the coming year? And two, uh, in response to your point, Mia, about support mechanisms, how do we need to reimagine and redesign this area to continue to empower women in this new area? And I guess that is um, with regard to support mechanisms um, around childcare, um, and sort of access to sectors where women are underrepresented. So let me put those to you first, Mia. Sure, thank you for your questions. So I would say uh, one thing we are choosing to challenge uh, in going into this new year is having more women represented at organizations that are making decisions about the future of technology. We believe that having more women represented in leadership teams, not just the worker bees, right? We have a lot of worker bee women. We need women in leadership roles so that they are at the table and they're making uh, decisions on which technology should be funded. Is this just like some toy or is this truly empowering women to do better and for their emotional well-being? Put 
women in charge of making decisions so that the funds are flowing to the right places, like the way Siobhan's doing in her role, and she is actively promoting causes that impact women and providing to, uh, structures. It's not that men couldn't do it, it's just they don't have those experiences right a working mother's experiences her own experience to just elevate those experiences and have them so we're making an active push to get more women into those roles um, the second is uh i would last year we when the we saw so many women in our community the women in AI ethics community being impacted by the pandemic they lost their jobs they lost their livelihoods they lost their visas they couldn't um all the opportunities they got their um their admissions um they got admitted to great schools but those offers were taken away they were struggling so we started a mentoring program and this is how technology can actually do good is we were able to support women uh, nearly 200 women from 30 countries and uh, women in our um, community stepped up to help these other women, to mentor them, help them through this um, time and giving the ideas and such. So we would love to expand on those programs, give more mentoring programs. The problem is the funding doesn't go towards, it. there are other organizations, uh, universities, and they're well-funded organizations, but they don't put enough um, effort into these programs because there's no ROI. So we found there were women coming from some of the most prestigious universities, from organizations who are very well funded, big tech names, who are coming to our teeny tiny program. We had a very tiny organization, but they were coming to us because no one else would support them. So I definitely see a need for mentorship type programs, solidarity programs, um, career um, support programs. But I saw one of the questions about how childcare should be, uh, I, I believe in universal child, childcare should be free. I feel like that if we could fix one thing other than healthcare, which is still a big challenge in America, it shouldn't be, but if we could make childcare free, I do believe that would empower women and it would really open up so, my, so many opportunities and reduce those hurdles, especially with, for working men, women with younger children. Yeah, what do you think, Siobhan? Oh, well, I mean, absolutely, uh, absolutely right, me. I mean, mine are a bit more uh, basic and prosaic than that. I mean, in that um, I'm hoping uh, that uh, uh, with the help of um, uh, organisations like your Institute, Kirsty, that we could perhaps force the government um, to ensure that every child on a free school meal uh, would have access to the internet and a device at home uh, to learn. Um, we know that the number of children on free school meals as mums uh, lose their work uh, are growing. Uh, and we know that these are precisely the children uh, who have been most affected by the lockdown. Um, a, lot, a quarter of children on free school meals did, uh, did less than one hour schoolwork a week uh, throughout the lockdown. And there is going to be a huge pressure uh, to try and help the children who are falling behind uh, to catch up. Um, and so while it isn't directly a woman's issue, it is indirectly a woman's issue because I am sure that, you know, many mums are really worried about what's happening to uh, their children and how they ever get them into a position where, you know, school works for them because we know that, you know, once you fall behind, once you can't keep up, the interest kind of wanes. And um, so, yeah, I'm hoping that we could perhaps uh, force the government into that position. It wouldn't resolve the problem, but it would be a huge step forward. Absolutely. Yeah, there can be a real vicious cycle, can't there, once there's discouragement and, um, you know, a, a bit of stigma or sort of embarrassment about progress, then it, it yeah. can spiral. Um, one thing that I think is a, maybe a small positive from the past year is sort of a bit of a shift in the political debate around what's the right, what is um, part of the legit legitimate part of education policy. So I think we've always known that the home environment was critical to students having good outcomes, but there's been a bit of a tight barrier around, you know, what is school's responsibility and what is education policy and what is, you know, something that need government needs to address, but it's, it's seen as separate. And of course it's completely um, interlinked. Mm -hmm. It, you know, it must be right that as part of uh, any government's approach for having a good education system, there must be um, means of getting people access to internet and access to devices and ensuring that they have, you know, decent nutrition 
um, while they're while they're doing their schoolwork and you know having those basics in place without which yeah. you can't learn. Yeah. Yeah, Mia, we have um, a thing where people who are on a very, very, very low income uh, have free school meals, uh, and it's uh, it's um, it, it's become a code for lots of other things, hasn't it? It's got it's a code for poverty. It's a code for um, not doing well at school. It's a, co a code for so much, and it was very much, I think, in the dark before the lockdown happened, and now it's become, you know whole swathes of the community who would never have thought about free school meals before think about them now and we've had an inspirational young footballer Marcus Rashford from Manchester United um, you know campaigning to get free school meals extended to school holidays and stuff so it's become the conversation of every day for for people who have not experienced free school meals which is also really important. Yes. I, I feel like it's 2021 and we in the Western, the more developed economies, we should not be having a conversation about should children be going hungry or not. And he yet here we are, right? I mean, there is, there is a huge disconnect. And I find that disconnect is between zip codes. In California, which, which is home to billionaires and maybe the largest number of billionaires. And yet we see there are people who can't even afford the basic meals and your access to internet is defined by your where you live. So people in urban areas and rural areas have limited access or no access. Uh, women who live in urban areas but in a certain zip code also do not have access, which are low income. And these are the folks who need more access to it. So it feels like yes. the ones that have already have the privilege of access are getting more and yet those who don't are just getting left behind so the real question is how do we make sure it's more equitable how does how do we make access to the just basic infrastructure right we call it basic food how uh, like maslow's hierarchy we're still at the bottom and we're still trying to figure how do we get food to everyone and if we have to talk internet and access to technologies then let's just make sure that we're not leaving these communities behind yeah, absolutely. I wanted to pick up on something you said just then, Mia, about um, uh, about um, caring professions, and um, I was thinking about how um, having to shift to remote learning has been a huge burden for teachers, and um, they will now have this kind of responsibility to help children catch up, um, having missed nearly a year's school, um, and the teachers can often sort of tend to fill the gap where you might at some point involve social workers as well and you know can end up doing a whole a whole load of sort of extra services to support children and their families and yet it's not a particularly well-paid profession and the same with um nursing and same with social care and even after this past year where you know we saw a huge in the UK at least a huge public upswell of sort of appreciation and gratitude for nurses and um other care workers and the NHS in general uh, we're still um, not particularly not paying them particularly well, not treating them particularly well. And I wondered, um, what? Why do you think the caring professions, which can be very female dominated, are so undervalued by society? What? And you know, ha what could we do to redress that? Um, and let me ask Siobhan first, and I'll come come back to you, Mia. Sorry. Well, I think that they are they are they are women's roles uh, traditionally, so they are undervalued and underpaid. Um, and uh, for a large part of at least um, uh, London and other over there, black women's work, certainly in the caring profession, uh, you know, it's an extraordinary that um, if you're a carer uh, in social care, either caring for people in their homes or caring for people in residential homes. Um, no sick pay, no holiday pay. Um, so many of these women, you, you know, they weren't going to be tested for coronavirus because they couldn't self-isolate anyway because there wasn't, you know, there was, you know, they weren't going to be able to feed the children or pay the rent or anything else. So I think it's, I think it's, I think it's that. I think, um, I think if men did the jobs, they would be quite well paid, wouldn't they? People would understand, wouldn't they? And they would be regarded as 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 uh, uh, as well paid jobs. I mean, in our in uh, in in Britain, the government have recently said uh, that the nurses will only have a one percent pay rise. Um, 
And I think it's only a matter of time before they back away from that, because I think the debt of gratitude that people feel towards um, NHS staff is huge uh, for what they've been through over the last year. But whether that will affect carers and how appallingly they are paid, I think the different, you know, I think that's a different question. And unless we deal with social care, they will be undervalued, underpaid and very badly treated. Could have sort of knock on effect for the rest of society and the economy because you know if you if you don't get these things right then there are costs for families and um you know if um sort of that can replicate themselves throughout society and throughout pe people's lives um mia does it look how does it look to you in the us it's uh, about the same i am sad to say we see the same statistics it doesn't matter which country and and We've always found that we, we say tech jobs pay more and a lot of uh, reskilling work is happening around tech. And yet we do need more of the social sciences. We need more investments in areas that women are leading. Um, and to your point, you pointed at something which is, we don't talk about a lot. The women's jobs are paid less. Uh, any roles that are traditionally female like nurses and caregivers are just paid less because it's cultural. As a society, we have been led to believe that what women do is not as valuable. And we need to now, through the pandemic, my hope is that we start rethinking that. I hope the pandemic at least forces us to rethink all these traditional norms. And every person who's on this, who's attending in the audience should go back to the workplaces and go back to the local governments and, uh, and, and their employers and ask like, why, why should, like what I do be valued less than what someone else is doing because just because of gender so and or race. So Absolutely. it's something we need to, I feel like even it also highlights the role of government. The government needs to take a more proactive role um, because I feel like there should be, a, I'm a big fan of universal basic income. I feel yeah. people's needs should be met. And this is something for women, especially caregivers. Maybe there should be a supplement because they do more. They're at home, they're working, and their work should be valued. I know these are radical ideas, but we're trying to undo systemic injustices for how many, like, centuries now? And if we don't take any radical steps, how do we even begin to address these? It's not going to happen incrementally because we leave so many behind. And like Siobhan said, it's going to impact generations. Mm. So we need to step up and do it now. And I do have a personal uh, uh, experience with the educational systems in that my child went through six different schools and that was just during <laughs> the years from elementary to middle schools and how the schools are not set up as is to meet the child's of special ed special education um, students who struggle who have learning disabilities and not only are we leaving with the pandemic that teachers are being impacted and not having the resources and support, but we're also leaving behind those who have those developmental um, challenges. So again, how do we come together, not just as a community, but also at a governmental level to provide more resources and support there? And we're at a time when radical action is needed by the sounds of it. I think that seems to be where we're coming to. Oh, Siobhan. Unlike, unlike Mia, I, I don't really support universal um, income um, because I believe that ja the jam would be spread very, very thinly. Uh, and I would, I would rather uh, concentrate on improving pe uh, people's pay and terms and conditions. And I think, that, I think that mentally, I think that socially work is really, really important and working and contributing is really important. I kind of have a problem with a kind of something for nothing idea that I actually, you know, I think work is important. And I think that the nature of work is going to change because if you, I mean, you all know more about it near than me, but um, I think we will see with artificial in intelligence, the stripping out of lots of uh, well-to-do jobs. We would, in the UK, we would call them middle-class jobs. You, that would be, that, you know, because middle-class doesn't really translate well, does it? Uh, between our countries but so you know the accountancy jobs the lawyers jobs those jobs are going to be badly affected uh, by artificial intelligence but we will always need people to care we will always need to people to look after the elderly or 
young children, we all, our healthcare systems will always grow. They are the jobs that are going to be long lasting. Mm. And, um, you know, maybe hopefully that we will in our mindsets get that they are the jobs that are, you know, really worth a, a good deal and should be paid well. Yeah. Well, um, personally, there's a really interesting question here from Chema Tricky or um, Kima. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Let me come to you and see if you'd like to ask your question um, live. Go ahead. Thank you. It's, it's Shema. Thank you for giving me the floor. I was just asking, if, um, because we were talking about technology and the role that they could play. Um, and one question that I had is the role that they could play in teaching empathy to children, um, because we're talking about women and the vision of uh, and the problems that women are are facing in their lives. And maybe if we can teach empathy, I don't know, through AI um, and tech projects and programs in school, they can learn more about different people from different paths in life, uh, from different social classes, from different economic backgrounds. And that might help um, in the future, at least future generation, bridging the gap of, um, of gender and other experiences and discriminations that people face in life. Thank you very much. Mia, does that yeah, AI to teach empathy, does that exist? And if so, does it work? I feel empathy comes from human beings and experiences. I do see cool uses of AI in art and music and appreciation. And I do think there is a role for AI in helping us get more access to different experiences, but there really is no substitute by as a society opening up those barriers and lowering the hurdles because there is this, um, we are divided by zip codes like here is where a certain community lives and here's another social class. And maybe if we just open up our learning and education system to include more women and more uh, people from marginalized communities, I feel that exposure would help us children more. And then they would be building technologies which actually reflect those experiences. But I think the key starts with human beings and uh, technology comes after. And uh, Siobhan, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, it's not something that I have ever thought about, but I, just listening um, to the question, I, I do think though um, uh, artificial intelligence computers uh, it goes, is a window to seeing how other people live. Um, but as Mia says, I think it's always going to be second to actually experiencing different people and their lives and understanding um, their, their culture. Um, and, you know, in the whole level of teaching, we're talking about tech and all the rest of it. But what we know is the most effective way of teaching is the teacher in front of the classroom. Yeah. And one thing that's kind of um, excited me over the past year is how my social life got much smaller <laughs> and narrower in terms of the things I could do. But the geographic breadth of who I could see and speak to felt bigger because, you know, all I could do was video calls. But it meant that there was no reason not to phone a friend in Paris or in the US or in New Zealand um, any more than there was to phone um, you know someone in South London so it kind of it made it made me certainly feel like um, my network was more global in that sense in that um, you know I was checking in with people um, you know in a much wider area than I um, might otherwise have been doing and I guess that's one way that sort of online tools can broaden people's horizons um, but we're coming up towards the end of our time together and to take us out on a positive note I wanted to ask you both what one thing have you learned or um, observed over the past year that gives you optimism for the future? Um, Siobhan, perhaps I can come to you first with that. Um, it's the way that people have stepped up to volunteer. Um, if, you could, if I can give you one example, most brilliant example is uh, my local football team, a soccer team uh, is uh, uh, AFC Wimbledon uh, and they, their nickname is the Dons. Uh, and they, uh, at the lock, first lockdown, uh, they stood outside supermarkets and collected food. Uh, and now they've collected over 300 parcels that they've delivered um, to people. They service food banks right across southwest London. Um, they've set up, after our discussions about access to internet and access to tech, they've set up a, a scheme where they have uh, refurbished over 2,000 laptops that they've delivered to kids in schools that um, don't have them. They've set up a furniture project so to provide families who don't have furniture with furniture items. Um, and they've um, 
and they're going to start a mentoring scheme for kids who have fallen behind. And that would never have happened but for the lockdown, that they have thousands of volunteers and everybody helps them and feels good about them. And this is their club. And it's it developed a sense of community, a sense of can do, a sense of feeling that there is injustice and it needs to be met. That's really encouraging. Um, Mia, how about you? Same, I have to say, I'm going through the pandemic. There have been a lot of dark negative news and there's just been a lot of grief and pain, but I do just seeing how everyone has stepped up, like our, the women in AI ethics community, I'm so grateful to have that community, um, whether in terms of mentoring others, just stepping up, taking time away, the time you could be spending with your own family, but just to step up and say, I'll help this person who's struggling or show up at an event to share the work that you're doing or encourage and enable other women to, to show up at events and just present. Um, it's just supporting each other, have the solidarity among the community has been incredible. And it's just not just women, but also a lot of allies have stepped up and because they see what women are going through and they've stepped up to help us and also get our voices up. And this is how I got in touch with you to give a big shout out to Max, <laughs> uh, Palmer, because he's the reason I'm here today, but I have to give a big shout out. It really brought out the best in folks. And so if there's one thing that gives me optimism, there's amazing folks out there, amazing women and really good people who want to do the right thing. We just have to give them the tools and give them the platform to do that. Absolutely. I think that's a really um, encouraging note. I, I would agree. I think as much as society has been sort of blown apart and dismantled and undermined, there have been sort of new groups and new structures and, um, you know, new opportunities to come together and that have been emerging that really... Um, really encouraging and really kind of um, inspiring, I think, in some cases. So um, that's been a really interesting conversation. Um, I will start to draw us to a close there. Did you want to make any um, last remarks before we wrap up? No, uh, oh, no, no, not really. Just to, say, yeah, just to say thank you very much for inviting me uh, and just to encourage every, anybody who's been watching this to do to do their bit to change their bit of the world because that's how the only reason only how it only gets changed great message so, yeah thank you so much and i do believe together we are stronger so if anyone wants to participate in this new wave of women in ai and ethics and you want to do your part to make the world of technology more diverse world of ai more ethical uh, please reach out i'm very easy to get hold of um, i'm on linkedin on twitter yeah would be happy to connect that's wonderful. That's been a really fascinating and wide ranging conversation. Thank you both so much. And thank you everyone for attending and participating. Thank you for your interesting questions. As I said, the session's recorded, so you can share it. It'll be available on the Tony Blair Institute YouTube channel um, very shortly, and you can share that for anyone that might have missed it. And keep an eye on our website and our Twitter as well, because some of these issues, um, including on equality in the workplace and equality in the tech world, are things that we're going to be working more on. So please um, keep in touch with us and reach out if you'd like to discuss any of these issues. Thank you very much. Goodbye.